Hey everyone. Good Welcome morning. Welcome back to Enter the Abyss, and it is morning. Yeah. We're and filming yes. this today, and we're going to post it later today. Yeah, this is like, I think, the closest to live you're going to get. <laughs> we're ever. doing it live. Fuck it. And yes, we are <laughs> drinking beer this morning. It's Bill O'Reilly here. Not the best choice we've ever made. Yeah. Especially because, um, I'm going to let them, I'm going to let you tell them what you decided to buy. Yeah, I got a heavy Pabst Blue Ribbon extra. Yeah, Pabst. We've sunk so low that we're drinking Pabst now. I thought you would like Pabst. You're no. kind of like a hipster guy. I you know? do not like Pabst at all. Yeah, Britain's smoking his vape right now, saying, dude. I mean, I might have, you, have to start vaping have because I'm drinking new, Pabst. Have you seen my new man bun, bro? This is not a man. Look, I have no hair. <laughs> You're fucking kidding me? I could bun my beard if I wanted. It's like, okay, we get it, bro. You're a hipster. I think what we've really realized is that you're fired from buying beer. <laughs> I think fucking I buy, Pabst. I think I, gr- I buy great beer. This is. You, I think it tastes you, really good. You buy great alcoholic beer, mm. but it's not good. Says the one who bought a beer called Terrible <laughs> at one point. He thought, I wonder how this will go. A viewer literally un- unsubscribed because of He that. was so He's, mad. Why would you buy something called Terrible? You're terrible. Yeah, what? It, he was so mad about it, too. He's like, you guys, you're idiots. Your show sucks. You literally bought a beer that says Terrible. It's like, okay, if you're that mad, <laughs> like, don't listen anymore. But welcome back to The Abyss. Sorry for our absence last week. A lot has happened since uh, we've recorded. Uh, my wife and I did an overnight stay in Vegas. First time without the kids since they've been born. Did you go to the scary shop? We did. The, uh, what was it called again? So we did a couple things. So first night we got there, we actually saw one of her podcasts live, and that's why we drank. They did a live show. It was actually really good because they, they covered like uh, their their ghost hunt they did at the Whaley House, and they had all the film and stuff. Ooh. Maybe we'll get there eventually. But they yeah, in Vegas, they're they're doing really well. Great show. And then the next day... We went to a place called Nightmare Toys. It was okay. But we went to a Nightmare Cafe, which is like a horror-themed restaurant. And they've got like seven or eight TVs around there that just plays the most gruesome death scenes from every movie. Like, while you're eating. It was it was so distracting, but so that's, cool. That's weird, man. I don't know it about was cool. that. I couldn't do it. You don't like gore, though. I don't like gore. But it's like the old school stuff, like 1980s and <laughs> slashers and stuff. When the, the food was horror-inspired, but... The cherry on top was we did the Zach Bagans Haunted Museum. Ooh. That thing was cool. I could go on and on. There were some parts that were, like, really hard, like, really hard to walk through because, like, he has serial killer stuff. I don't remember the serial killer's name, but he was the guy who killed six male sex workers. And he had the actual bed with the sheets that had actual blood and fecal material on it. Oh, no. It was rough. You want to touch it? No, I don't. Um, but he had a room full of dolls. That was cool. Huh. So, yeah. And I, I was going to tell you, they do an overnight. Well, not overnight. It's after hours. They give you flashlights and they let you walk around un, like supervised, I guess. There's cameras everywhere. But we should do it. Yeah, I'd be down. We should definitely do it. But, yeah, it was fun. So we did a lot. And, uh, again, sorry for our absence, but we're back. Drinking Pabst. Fucking lowest point of the show here. Yeah. I, uh... I have one story. I went to go visit my parents in St. George, and um, we drove over to Mesquite again. Did you I go to Lee's? I don't want to be one of those. Yeah, we went to Lee's, and we bought some liquor. But Pabst? Yeah. Is that what you bought yeah, at Lee's? Yeah, PBR. And I bought some <laughs> whiskey, but I ended up drinking it all. Um, I know, right? Did you get the mm. peanut butter kind? Yeah, I did. That stuff is so good. Um, so anyways, gambling's bad. But I'm like, all right, I got five minutes before we have to like head home after getting the liquor. So I go into the casino with uh, 100 bucks. Put it all on black. And this guy sitting next to me sees me do that. And then he bets on red. I'm like, you son of a bitch. Oh, <laughs> like, no. He bets like 20 bucks on red. Made I, eye contact. like, check this out. Yeah. So, Mike, are you? I, I turn to him. I'm like, are you really betting against me? And he's like, yeah, you know, just you know, make it fun. So I win, right? And I'm like, keep it on there. Like, oh, now I have 200 snap. bucks on black. And, uh, and then he, again, bets against me on red and just like doubled his bet. Right? So Lo and behold, you don't realize bucks. he's a retired millionaire. Yeah. He's like, I can go for hours, dude. I won again. So I'm at like 400 bucks, and then I just left. <laughs> like, I swear I'm the most unlucky person. But for whatever reason, whenever I go to that casino and make a reckless bet, I always win. It it's was the, the same one where I won 600 bucks like It's that one that's year. like right when you enter, right? Next to the McDonald's. What's it called? It's the ghetto looking one. Yeah. Not the, the new one. The big ghetto one. Yeah. Yeah. What's it called? I don't know what it's, it's called. Uh, yeah. We, we go in there several times. Me and my brother... 
had like 40 in cash and we turned it into like 90 we played all night i'm up like 700 bucks on that place anyways yeah. don't gamble you We're, lose your money yeah, so me and my wife, before the show starting, because they played in the Mirage uh, Theater, so we're walking around, we each had 20 bucks in cash, gone like that. So we're not luck- lucky like you, but I'm, I'm really good about saying I have this much cash, when it's gone, it's gone, that's it, walking away. I don't have that I once streak. I once lost a game of 21 to Britain 30 times in a row. Yes, that's this how is unlucky true. I am, so it's really weird <laughs> that I'm winning a lot lately. But anyways, we are doing a thread today uh, called Reddit. What is this... Reddit, what was the scariest place you have ever been to? What's the scariest place you've ever been to, Cleet? Let's start there. Your mom's house. Yeah, it's pretty scary. Scared the there. shit out of me. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't really have any scary spots. I mean, we used to break into abandoned buildings. Yeah. I told you the story. There used to be the hospital up in Salt Lake. Um, it was like abandoned, and they were like constructing it into apartments. It was like when I was like 17. But only like a third of it was done, so it was just a giant, big old medical building. And we like hopped the gates and went up there and was just chilling with a Ouija board. And uh, my yeah. friends got scared and ran away. I, oh, yeah, and they left you there alone. Yeah. Yeah, you they left the story. Ouija board on the ground. I had to fi- find the planchette. They like threw it. You're like, <sighs> yeah, it was annoying. Yeah. Cool. I honestly don't know. We used to do that too, but like there was this house in our old neighborhood that we made up stories about, like, oh, he killed his wife in the basement. So like you get in your head, but I don't know. Anyway. Okay, this is from Cafe Diaries. Ooh. Reconstructed subway, which exploded years ago in Daegu, Korea. They memorialized the explosion on site. Scorched walls, melted people's items, burnt phone booths and all. But the scariest was the scorched walls with writings and handprints of the people that were trapped during the explosion. Jesus Christ. This subway is one of the busiest stations even today due to being the city's busy due to being the city's downtown area. No, it's not the sandwich shop. It's a train station underground. LOL. It's like, man, that public transit is so cheap. I don't care if a bunch of people died on it last year. They just made it inconvenient when they shut it down. That's crazy. To see the handprints of people that were literally burned to death. Yeah. No, thanks. Mm. No, thanks. All right, this one is from Mitt Romney, USA. Oh, my God. (laughs) Just reading the name, Britt. Just reading the name. I have yet to have a sip of this beer. I'm putting it off so much. Probably a cave, wriggling through a lemon drop, as they call it, where your feet down first, a skinny-ass tunnel, and have to wiggle around 12 inches before you drop into the chamber below. About halfway, my shoulders got stuck, and it took about five excruciating minutes to get loose. I don't know why I went spelunking. I'm claustrophobic. To answer a few common questions, one, I got out through an exit at the bottom of the cave. The entrance was uphill, so you had to turn back or go through the lemon drop to get out. Two, I had kind of forgotten I'm claustrophobic, or I guess it's better to say my claustrophobia improved, and I didn't really feel like the walls were closing in until I literally was, they were squeezing against me from all sides. I don't know why I went there. It was a free event, and I I was probably pretty high and bored at the time. Yeah, that'll do it. I I, I will say caving does scare me. Like Caving normally is fine, but spelunking, no. Yeah. No. It's... um, yeah, ever since a guy died in muddy putty caves, I'm like, I don't really want to go there. Dude, yeah, yeah upside no down like that? No. No, thanks. Oh, look, the next post says nutty putty cave incident. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this comes from Grave Girl. I don't know why the fuck this happened, but by the end of it, you'll understand when I say my parents aren't known for making the best decisions. So when I was 9 or 10, my dad took me to this house that had been basically destroyed by fire. I don't remember exactly whether my mother was there or she just okayed this. They were not together, ever. There were other adults involved in this too. I think my uncle and one of my dad's buddies, but I was the only kid. Anyway, we went into this fire-destroyed house to look for shit that could be salvaged. We found very little, and really, that should have been nothing at all. All I really recall anymore was an 8-track tape that had been wrapped, that had been warped just enough by the fire to play two songs at once in spots. So there's little kid me, after dark, picking my way through this fucking burnt house full of debris. And I get into one room and look into what had been the closet. And there's this shag rug looking thing there. Which is when my dad helpfully told me that the daughter of this house had run back inside the fire to try to save the family dog. And died in the closet with her arms wrapped around the animal. Holy shit. And that wasn't a rug, but the remains of the dog's body. And then I was encouraged to look through this dead kid's toys to see if anything was in good enough condition for me to take home. (laughs) 
It's okay. My parents used to take me to Toys R Us. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you want a new toy? Is there any houses that have burned down recently? Oh, any Lord. kids that have died there's that you a, can take their toys? There's a burnt fingernail on this toy. I don't know. Just brush it off. You're good. This one is from Ah FFS. I'm too old for this. Some parents make terrible choices. When I was maybe eight years old, my father told me that my arms dangled over the bed when I sleep. The thing under my bed would slip my wrists. Oh, oh so that God. was a cautionary tale. If you dangle your hands over the bed, the monster will do that. The monster's going to slit your wrist? <laughs> I would tell that to kid. Now, now, now I sleep in the direct middle of the king-size mattress. It's completely illogical, but I can't let it go. Like, I would imagine a parent saying, hey, the monster's going to grab you, but like, hey, if your wrist is hanging out, he's going to slit your wrist. Oh, he'll get you. As a child? He also told me about how killers will lay under cars and slice your Achilles tendon. Oh, my as God. this was something that just happened all the time. <laughs> they call him the, the Achilles man. Not sure about the OP's parents, but mine should have stayed child free because they were responding to that other story. But, yeah. dear God. Yeah, this comes from Pornasonic. Got stuck in my car in a freezing step during a really bad snowstorm at negative 45 degrees Celsius. That's that's a little cold. Mm. The snow was real deep, and my car was stuck so badly it would take a truck to pull it out. Cell phone didn't work. Maps didn't work. You're going to die. Yeah. For those who don't know, once the engine dies, you have about 12 hours before you freeze to death. The worst thing is that the snow was so deep and the storm was so bad they probably wouldn't have found me until spring. I've been in a bunch of life-threatening situations in my lifetime, but fuck. Nothing as scary as freezing to death in the middle of nowhere. Thankfully, another guy saw me. He happened to be driving a real pumped-up land cruiser, all geared up and shit. He gave me a real confused look once he realized I was driving a Jaguar XE. Probably the last fucking car you want to drive there. It would have been okay if I stayed on the road, I guess, but I couldn't see because of the storm and wandered about 50 meters off-road. He pulled me out and led me for two hours at 40 kilometers an hour, given he could easily do 120 thanks to his car. So he's like, wow, off-roading in a Jaguar, huh? Fucking idiot. Nice Jag, bro. All right, this one is from Hockey Joker. I had just crossed over the border into China from Kazakhstan. For some reason, my buddy and I made it a plan to hit as many haunted houses as we could for whatever reason. There were plenty on our route from Moscow to Delhi. For whatever reason, for yeah. some reason, these guys are just like, I don't know, we just do shit. And I'm, I don't know how I'm going to pronounce the city. We found out about one in Ermiki, <laughs> or Mickey, and decided to go. As we went down these dank stairs. <laughs> dank? <laughs> what? Is this dank? <laughs> Those stairs are dank. I don't think that word means what you think it means, maybe. No. Um, as we went down these dank stairs into what seemed like once was part of an underground system, everything just felt wrong. The person there had us sit in these gross chairs in the front of this odd raised platform. Out of nowhere, this girl, and I mean no more than 14, comes out in a skimpy leopard print outfit with a snake. What the fuck? Um, we are getting the fuck out vibes, but are the only ones there, and the dudes running the place are right behind us. <laughs> so we proceed to watch this girl pop the snake's head into her mouth and swing it around like a helicopter. After the show, they tried to guide us to these rooms with the grossest mattresses on the planet on the ground. Whoa. It was really sad, creepy, and disgusting. All we could do is shove some RMB in the guy's hand and run out. Oh, it's like the currency or something? I wouldn't even know how to feel about that. I hope the girl's okay. Yeah, I hope sad. the snake's okay. This is like the fifth girl. They've all died from snake bites. <clears throat> On their tongue. <laughs> this is from Black Cat 1206 I went to a special needs school until I was 11, and me and a group of mates, all with various disabilities, were sent away on a separate scheme from the school. The scheme was organized and run by young Christian Catholic medical students. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with Christian and Catholic people in general, but these people were wrong on more levels than you can imagine. Uh-oh. There were at least five other special needs school there on the scheme. All the other children also had various disabilities and needs. They used the week to use us kids in experimental treatments and examinations, in between taking us on field trips and enforced religious services and activities, regardless of our religion. They force-fed my best mate meat, even though it said on her permission form that being Pakistani, she was a strict vegetarian. <laughs> 
dislocated my other mate's hip by throwing him playfully in the air. (laughs) Off a hill. And didn't brush my hair for the entire week. At night, you couldn't sleep for the drunken, whopping, and loud grunts of pleasure from said medical students. Wow. They're just writing prescriptions. You were also quite fearful of certain male members coming to check on you in the middle of the night, too. And we came up with a keep-safe solution when it happened. This all resulted in us having enough and planning a prison break where me and an able-bodied mate done a runner from the mansion. We didn't get far, though, not surprising, as we were both only 10 years old and my mate who was pushing my wheelchair was autistic. We got as far as the gates at the bottom of the hill before we were rounded up and carted back in the van. We are both reprimanded severely and banned from going out for one day, but the rest of our mates thought we were here, so that was good. When we got home, we all told our parents about the awful week and the school were informed. The school already knew about our friend with a dislocated hip, as he had to stay in hospital overnight when it happened. So they weren't too happy with the scheme anyway. The school never used the scheme again after that year. What the fuck did I just read? I don't know, man. <laughs> that one was so it's pushed wild. me away in my wheelchair. Prison break in a wheelchair. That's not easy to hour. do. This one is uh, from Reams1234. I spent two weeks alone at an abandoned silk factory and nuclear waste cleanup site in a small rural town. No electricity. It was 120 years old. The roof's collapsing. It was creepy, dark, wet, strange noises. One corner of an upper floor was walled off with plastic sheeting, work lights, and a table. Never did figure out what was going on up there. There was an eyeball scrawled on the wall in another area and a red marker with the words, It sheds the blood here. Underneath. What the fuck? The building is gone now. I I, I feel like there's more to the story. Like, how did you, why did you spend all that time there? There's always more to the story. That's how they get you there. Like. I had this crazy thing happen. Jesus visited me one night, and I can't tell you what he said. <laughs> Hello, my child. Okay, someone asked, like, why were you there? And he said, it is what I do for work. Mostly I have a crew of four to eight, but the building was relatively small. I survey buildings for demolition. Okay, uh, that makes more sense. Okay. Well, debunked. This is from Almost Infinity. Last year, I lived in a suburb in Gifu Prefecture. Down the street was a broken down old house, and my friend and I decided to do a photo shoot there one night, because an old broken Japanese house looked pretty cool. When I say broken down, I mean entire walls were missing and exposing the inside. Floors were broken, and lots of old junk everywhere. Pipes and beams were exposed, and there were crates of old belongings. There was one crate, though, that had hundreds of photos of the same girl, as a child to adulthood. Black and white, developed from film. It was always just her and no one else in the photo. I thought it was strange that the old owners could just leave photos of this girl behind. That's really weird. The more I looked at them, I noticed she didn't seem happy in a lot of them. I got really uncomfortable, so my friend and I left and abandoned the photo shoot. I think she might have been a victim of something, and that's why the photos were left behind in a half-destroyed house. Got really freaked out that night. If you if you just happen to stumble across a box of photos, almost always not a good thing. I'm gonna in a, look. in a desolate place. Yeah, you're gonna, gonna look. look, but then you know it's just, just photos of me walking to this house every day. Like you have a picture of you going and leaving your home. It's like it's the first time I've been here. Why is there a box of photos of me? All right, it's a picture of you looking in the box. Like that's fucking impossible. <laughs> it's fucking impossible. Like looking all weird. <laughs> this one is from Port Arosa, the stride at Bolton Abbey. It's not too far from where I used to live, so I decided to go there once. It was most unassuming thing you can imagine, but knowing how dangerous it is just makes it seem ominous, especially when you consider how many people it may have killed and how few people ever wash up. I didn't go within 10 feet of the building. For those of you who don't know what strid or stride is, it's what happens when a fast-flowing river basically turns on its side, putting a vast amount of water through very slim, very deep, very dark groove in the ground. It looks calm on the surface, but if you fall in, you're royally fucked. There is a claim that it might be one of the most dangerous stretches of water in the world, and I can't readily and I can readily believe it. That's so Damn. interesting. Like that looks peaceful. They're going for a dip. Yeah, <laughs> like you go and Done. swim in it, and you're just sucked under. See ya. Okay, this comes from Hazel the Bunny, Russia. It all says Russia. Period. <laughs> Everyone I met had minimum one to two immediate family members who had either been murdered, 
committed suicide, or died young in an quote-unquote accident, or were in prison. Once I'd got home, within a month, at least three of the very close people I'd met, all from one family, had died by different reasons. One, picking mushrooms, died alone in the forest. Two, died alone in an apartment, no reason. Three, died from tuberculosis, in quotations. Doubt it, she was seven months pregnant when I'd seen her. Bad partner, super depressed. My guess, suicide or intimate partner violence. Fucking scary place. Russia. Just Russia, huh? The Russia. whole country is just the scariest place you can think of. Well, you're going to die by picking mushrooms alone. <laughs> well, it's a scary fucking place. And what happened? Wendigo. They just picked a mushroom and they had probably a heart ate attack. It. It's like, this looks like Ooh, a good no. mushroom. Ah, oh, that one's poisonous. The insides. All right, this one is from Claver Jadri. Okay. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> what? Claver Jadri. Okay. The old graveyard of all goose. In the Herf, Heralt, France. <laughs> You're getting these wild pronunciations. Yeah, very easy to say. I was camping in the neighborhood, and we visited a village old and beautiful. We were young and inquisitive and climbed the wall around an old graveyard. What we found were 19th century graves, often in little grave houses. But grave robbers had yanked the lead coffins out of the houses, and everywhere were open coffins and skeletons. Good God. I was actually very sad. To, it was actually very sad to behold. There were five of us, and without a warning, we all ran to the wall and jumped back to the world of the living. We all had a feeling that we should not stay there any longer. We could not explain it. Just an overwhelming feeling of terror. About 15 years later, I passed the cemetery on the back of a motorbike and just looked through a crack in the wall. I was struck with a feeling. It's not a good place. Yeah, this looks like a nice old cemetery. Let's go pay homage. Just take take a, bunch a of skeleton fucking home. skeletons yeah. out. All right, this comes from Deleted. An Airbnb in Barcelona. I've spent quite a while in Spain, speak Spanish, and have visited Barcelona multiple times. I've also used Airbnb multiple times and know what to check for. Two friends and I, all 20s, female, picked an Airbnb with several favorable ratings in what, a good neighborhood. What do you check for in an Airbnb? It, well, it just it, as long as it says no one's been murdered, you're good. There's like giant cameras in the bathroom. Yeah, just behind the mirrors, right at the toilet. No, just just out just in the open. Zooms a in. A giant camera, a red light. <laughs> so you're always recording. recording. We just don't want you to steal the toilet water. <laughs> you just don't want you to steal too much toilet paper. That's all it is. One of the ones that's a room in someone's apartment. Show up and the two guys look nothing like the picture, but are very hospitable. So we went inside. They showed us around and the apartment looked like the photos. Then they showed us the room and let us be. We open the door to the room and it's nothing like the photos. It's essentially a closet. Three dirty twin mattresses on the floor with no pillows and blankets, covered in old food. God. It's a dungeon? Yeah. The dungeon experience? Furthermore, the door to the room has no interior lock on it, but did have an exterior lock. <laughs> that's, your, that's your cue to leave. It's at this point that we realize they never gave us a key to the apartment. We took pictures of everything and waited until we heard them leave the apartment and watched them from the window until they were out of sight. We gathered our packs and sprinted out of there with no plans on where to go, just calling random hotels until we found one that had a room. But it was on the other side of the city, and the metro had closed for the night, so we walked an hour and a half. Thankfully, the hostel was lovely, and Airbnb refunded us and removed the listing. But we're convinced it was a human trafficking setup. You fucking think? There's chains on the wall. Three mattresses, a couple couple half-eaten McDoubles. It's like, hey, make yourself home. Make yourself at home. All right. This one is from Gully Wump. My parents spent a lot of time in war zones for their careers and had strange ideas about what made a good family holiday. So anyways, we ended up going to Egypt and Libya in 2011. If you don't know... This was the year of the Cairo riots, Egyptian revolution, and the Libyan civil war. I was 15, really made me see the world differently. In multiple ways, saw lots of scary people with guns, but also slept under the stars in the Libyan desert and saw the night sky with zero light pollution. Nothing can prepare you for the sheer brightness of the stars when everything else around you is pitch black. That also changed me made me understand how insignificant and tiny we really are. Also, got to see the pyramids at a time that no other tourist 
whole place was totally abandoned. But that's irrelevant to the question, I guess. Overall, it was an 8 out of 10 holiday. Probably won't take any of my potential future kids into a war zone, though. I wouldn't recommend. Yeah, not the, not the family trip that you want. Okay, this comes from Centered Sis. My experience was more about the circumstances than the place. I went to a university that offered volunteer opportunities that included cheap international trips. I went on a trip with 20 other clueless Midwestern teens traveling to a school in the mountains of Bolivia. The road was a sheer cliff face on one side and a steep drop off on the other. And of course, there were crosses along the roadside marking where vehicles had gone over the side. This was just nerve-wracking until the driver stopped the bus for what we thought was just taking a break. Then he scooted under the front wheels of the bus, came out, rooted around in a box and found a wire coat hanger, scooted back under the bus with the coat hanger and came out without it. Then, vamanos, our nervousness turns to concern. At the next stop, a woman gets on as we're leaving and drapes her arm over the driver's shoulder and then pr- and they proceed to semi-make out while <laughs> he is driving. Several of us were white-knuckled at this point. When it gets dark, the driver and his girl light up and we smell weed. So now we got a stoned driver getting a hand job in a bus <laughs> held together by a coat hanger cruising around these hairpin turns in the dark. <laughs> Good thing it was a Christian college and we all knew the words to say, Nearer my God to thee. <laughs> that sounds like a hell of a Saturday night. Bus driver's like, hey, you got any weed? Hey, uh, you want to do me a favor? I got weed. You got hands? <laughs> <laughs> no one rides for free. <laughs> oh, my God. Can you imagine being a passenger on that? You're like, uh, dude, you're swerving a lot. I'm almost there, boys. Oh, yeah, he was almost there. All right. This one is from Cooch. A small gas station on the outskirts of El Paso. Oh, my God. <laughs> small, Are you okay? Uh, I don't know. El Paso is how that's yeah, pronounced. Yeah, I know, I know. A small gas station on the outskirts of El Paso. It was winter. I was 19 or 20. I remember people had mentioned random violence in the area, but I needed gas in my car. I stopped at a station to fill up. It's cold, so I wore my jacket. As I'm filling up, three guys start walking my way. I saw them from the peripheral and kept a watch on them, but didn't make it obvious. They approached my car, one standing on the opposite side, and the other, two, each going on the separate side. I stopped pumping fuel and casually said, what's up, to which they asked if they could have some cash for food. I told them I didn't have any cash on me. I remember one of them saying, I said, in an aggressive tone, and they started coming closer. I stepped back, unzipped my jacket, and stuck my hand on the side inside my jacket and said, I don't know what you want. But I don't have it, and this isn't going to be worth it. They looked at each other, and there was a palpable tenseness in the air, but they eventually went across the street and left. To this day, I'm convinced by the entire thing and how it felt. I was close to being jumped and or carjacked. I'm glad they thought I was armed because I didn't have shit in my pocket, but a pack of cigarettes and a Sears Tower Zippo lighter. Whew. Yeah, a Zippo lighter is probably worth a good yeah, penny. You could pour Achim. gas on him and then throw the lighter throw at one it, of them. Because yeah. he has gas in his other pocket. Go put your friend out of... Flames. Yeah. I'm, I'm, my brain isn't working. What the hell? <laughs> go put your friend out of <sighs> his misery. Go help your fucking friend, man. See ya. There you go. That's the way to say it. All right. From Deleted. The market at night near my grandparents' house in India. For context, I am an Indian American, so I visit India pretty often. One time, my grandparents needed something from the market, so they asked my mom to go. Typically, women don't go by themselves at night because, sadly, it's really common for women to be raped. So my mom asked me to come with her, too. That shit is scary as fuck. There were only about three street lamps. Mind you, this was in a pretty big city in India, so that's kind of uncommon. The market itself was the whole street, and we had to go deeper into the market to get to the store we needed. There wasn't a single woman or kid. Only grown men staring at us while they had a drink or cigarette. The entire time I was only thinking about what my mother and I would do in case any of them attacked. We got to the store we needed and got the thing. That's vague. But the storekeeper looked at us really weird as if he was surveying us. Even after we left the store I could still see him looking at us. I wanted to go back to my grandparents house as fast as possible but my mother was wearing a sari. She doesn't wear that in America, just in India and it's impossible to run in that shit. At least the way my mom was wearing it. It was super hard. 
She's like slithering away from it. Eventually, after we passed a group of men sitting on a motorcycle, we see them all get up and start following us. At this point, my mom also started to panic and we both practically ran, more like speed walking, but my mom was going as fast as she could. We got on the main road where there were far more people and a lot more light. The men stopped and went back to the motorcycle. I honestly can't tell you how scary that was, the fact that I could have been murdered and my mom possibly raped before she was murdered. That's okay. There was no mistake. These men were coming after us, and ever since then, neither me or my mom or anyone from my family went to that market at night. This one is from uh, Buddha MJ's. Bennington Hollow, holler to the locals, is in Ash County, North Carolina. Bennington Holler. Hello. I don't know if it's still this way today, but back in the 90s, everyone who lived there was named Pennington, or you didn't go there unless your name what? was Pennington. What the fuck? <laughs> the, the cops didn't even go there. What? Think of the movie Deliverance. Huh? There was a whole classroom in my high school for the special Pennington kids. Uh, Pennington and everyone raises their hand. Just a whole city full of people named Pennington. I once accidentally drove my little 49cc scooter into Pennington Holler when exploring random back roads. Once I realized where I was, I turned off my engine and went into bicycle mode and noped the fuck out of there. So is it just like... It's like a little, a like, weird culty Pennington place? Or just like a big polygamist compound or something? I don't know. You can't be here unless your name is Pennington. What the fuck is that all about? Okay, this is from 2 a.m. time. Okay, okay. I've been absolutely dying to talk about this to anyone I can. Oh, we're in for a good story, Cleet. When I was 14, my family went up north to this town called Gaines in Pennsylvania. If you're from the area, you know the main town is lovely, but the outskirts can be quite questionable. My grandfather was from the outskirts, and I swear the whole trip was just creepy. On the way up, our GPS made us take this dirt road off the highway. Once we were going down the road for about 10 minutes, we found ourselves in front of this old farmhouse that looked as if it were straight out of a horror film with a field next to it that only had one cow in it. The cow looked as if it hadn't been groomed in a long while, and it visibly had an impacted tooth, tumor-like swelling in the face, and everything just looked run down. We eventually got back to the highway and made it, and we still talk about the road every Halloween. That was just the beginning of the trip. My grandfather's house was very, we could say, patched up. The original building itself was built in the 1890s as a brothel, hey, <laughs> if I remember properly. But since then, my grandfather had added a porch and a new kitchen as much of the original building was unstable and he had to seal it off. The structure was actually quite comparable to the movie Monster House. The house was always off-putting and we weren't helped by the fact that it was freezing since this was around late November and we were in the mountains of northern Pennsylvania, almost New York. We slept in the guest bedroom on the second floor and constantly heard footsteps in the third floor hallways, and we adjusted by the time we left, but the first night was restless. If I ever go back to Gaines, I can tell you I'm not staying in that house. The house aside, the neighborhood itself was actually creepier. Almost every truck we saw driving around was missing a license plate. There was a trailer park at the end of my grandfather's street, and two of the probably 30 trailers were selling guns out of them. Oh, nice. <laughs> All of the people in the neighborhood were reminiscent of characters from The Hills Have Eyes, and as a very sheltered and geeky 14-year-old, I was terrified and intrigued at the same time. So, Hills Have Eyes with guns. After talking to my grandfather for a little bit about the interesting characters of the neighborhood, my mom, thankfully, told me to stop taking walks around the neighborhood, as there were several registered sex offenders and unmarked cars. I spent the rest of the trip inside the house for the most part, adjusted to the footsteps and the creepy energy as well as the smell of sulfur in the water. Why would you stay here? Like, that's just a fucking horrible trip. On the third night of our stay, things somehow managed to get creepier. On the third night and every night after of our eight-day stay, fucking eight days here, there was a rolling blackout. This rolling blackout was different than what you'd imagine, though. At midnight, on the dot, the dogs in the whole neighborhood would start barking. The lights would start going out sequentially down the street, and until the power went out in our house, the TV would remain static. 
As a disclaimer, I was not mentally sound prior to or during the trip, and there were many family scandals going on at the time, so my perception may have been skewed, but that neighborhood was the scariest place on earth the way I saw it. This one is from Money Printers. Hey. I've been to Mexico a couple times for business trips. A majority of the time, it's awesome, but I've seen, but I've been in some dangerous situations. We usually have someone who worked for us waiting at the airport to transport us anywhere for the weekend since I didn't speak much Spanish and didn't know my way. It was late at night and we just left one of our resorts. After maybe 20 minutes of driving, I was told to hide my face by the driver. It felt like something from a movie. All he told me was to not show I was American. I'm pretty sure cartels camp out near where we went and wait to find someone American since they're most vulnerable. To this day, I have no idea if he was fucking with me, but it was one of the most scariest moments ever. Okay, this comes from Deleted. Back in college about 10 years ago, I took a trip to Memphis for a fraternity conference. I had been drinking a bit with some friends, and we decided that we wanted to save a little money and drink in our hotel. That meant that one of us had to walk to a liquor store to buy beer. We ended up playing rock, paper, scissors, and I lost, so I walked the four blocks through a somewhat sketchy neighborhood. Why don't all of you walk together? Fucking idiots. On my way there, a homeless man started to talk to me and walk alongside me. He told me that he knew the way to the liquor store, and honestly, he seemed harmless enough that I just let him tag along with me, and I decided I wanted someone to talk to anyway. It's down this dark alley. We got to the liquor store, and he said, Sir, if you buy me something, I'll be your best friend. I was a little buzzed, so I told him to pick out whatever he wanted. He walked over to the fridge and grabbed a tall boy of Miller High Life. Surprised he didn't go for the Paps Blue Ribbon Extra. Yeah, better choice. <laughs> I asked him if he wanted anything else, and he said, No, sir, this is all I want. Thank you. God bless you. <laughs> I bought it for him, got myself two cases of beer, and we walked out together, him following me. I turned around once I got outside, and the dude just disappeared. Like Ninja Vanish. It was a little unnerving, like he was a god of ancient myth or an angel just turning into mist. He just fucking books it. He's like, <laughs> he's like, in case you change your mind, I'm just going to fucking sprint away. <laughs> oh, my God. Not to be deterred and still pretty drunk, I started to walk back to the hotel. I'd always be like, where the fuck did he go? Like, he's just creeping behind you like, this is some good high life. <laughs> To uh, see an empty can of the beer at his Yeah, it's just like area. spinning. <laughs> it's like, oh my god. And you just hear, high life. High <laughs> you life. live in the high life yet? I need another high life. I turned down a street that looked pretty deserted. I found myself on the darkest, most deserted part of the street. When around the corner came four guys walking in a group toward me. The, the guy's going to come around him. and just fucking kill them all. Yeah. He's like, this guy got me beer. Hobo with a shotgun. Ride or die. That's a good movie. Yeah. My plan was just to keep walking, but when we got close, they stopped me and demanded that I give them some beer. Still being drunk and invincible, I said, nah, man, I'm good. The <laughs> liquor store is just around the corner. <laughs> nah, man. This is like from I'm a movie. Good. This is from a movie. Yeah. The same guy got a little louder and said, You're going to give me some beer. I'm going to kill your whole family. I don't think you heard me. I want your beer, and you're going to give it to me, or I might hurt you. Again, I said, I don't think so. And then he heard a, a high life can came flying through the fucking air, started to walk past them. The guy put his hands on me, and then like fucking Batman, the homeless guy dropped from the sky into the middle of us and started screaming, This is my best friend, and you better leave him alone. He's the best friend I ever had. Yada, yada. This is the best story we've ever read. 100%. He made so much noise that a police officer about a block away came driving over and turned on his siren. Crowd dispersed immediately, and I just stood there, alone, with my beer, and walked back to my hotel. <laughs> Never saw the homeless guy again. To this day, still not sure he was real. <laughs> Dude, that is amazing. He probably wasn't real. This guy's probably, like, super, super drunk. He's like, hey, this guy came and he broke up a fight, and he saved my life. It's like That's a week hilarious. later, I fell asleep with a beer, half drunk on my nightstand. I woke up and it was, it was drank. It was gone. It was gone. 
And you'll never guess what it was. The can was crushed. High life. <laughs> and I looked out my window, and there was the Batman hobo <laughs> signal shining bright in the sky. Holy shit. That's a good way to end that's it. That's a good one, man. So, that's going to end our episode for this morning, and we will post it tonight. Um, thank you all for joining us. If you want to support the show, we do have our Buzzsprout subscription service. It'll be linked in the description and on YouTube. Thank you to our five subscribers, Mothman, Devin, Conklin Family, Lou, and Haley. If you're watching this on YouTube, please like, share, and subscribe, as it really helps us get us out there. And as always, thank you for entering the abyss. Until next time.